Hello, and welcome to our second topic on object-oriented programming. In this video, I'm going to go over access modifiers, how access to various parts of objects are controlled in Java, who can access them and who can't. I'll go over how to use and what the keyword static means, and that's part of uh, uh, the mystery of the main method, right? Public, static, void, main. We've seen what void means. It's the return type. We're going to see what static means. And in fact, we're going to see what public means because that's one of these access modifiers. And then uh, the third part will be about interfaces and what's called the class hierarchy and an example of that. So first, some background to understand what access modifiers are doing. Uh, Java groups classes into packages, and this is how Java uh, collects groups of related classes. And this is somewhat similar to modules in, in Python, that in Python, if you uh, say import uh, the numeric computation module NumPy, uh, that has within it a number of different objects and functions that, that are related and, and Java packages are a similar idea. So for example, the java.lang package is what includes built-in classes such as string and math. And these classes are always available to our Java programs. They don't need to be imported. So this java.lang package is always present. Uh, other classes like we've seen, uh, scanner for example, do need to be imported to be used. So when we got when when we read input uh, from the terminal in uh, in previous topics, we did so using a scanner object, and in order to have access to that, we had import java.util.scanner up at the top of our Java file. Now this wasn't strictly necessary. Uh, we could have omitted this import statement and instead. Uh, written java.util.scanner everywhere that we wanted to use scanner, uh, but in general we're not going to want to do that and we'll, we'll have an import so that we can use the, the shorter name. And uh, packages like classes are a layer of encapsulation, meaning they're grouping related things together in a way that can usefully hide implementation, implementation details from uh, people using that code who don't need to know about those details. All right, so uh, we won't really deal with making our own packages uh, in this course, but it is how Java uh, code is organized. And in fact, if you go to the Java documentation uh, and look up here at the top, um, there's uh, kind of an, an, an entry for package as well as class. So if we're, we're currently looking at the java.util package, and uh, if we scroll through and go to the scanner class, now we're looking at a class within the java.util package, and there's actually another layer module, java.base, that has a number, that groups a number of packages together. All right, so that's the background on packages. And to support abstraction, uh, Java provides a way to specify the access level of classes, methods, and fields. So this means that abstraction means that uh, we're only thinking about the interface of an object, like the methods, how we can interact with it, and not about the underlying details. And in fact, the underlying implementation details are free to change as long as that interface, as long as that set of methods uh, that we've been promised this object will provide, as long as those still work uh, the same way uh, in terms of their documented effects, the details of the implementation are abstracted. And so uh, Java actually uh, lets you specify for each method and field in a class who can access it uh, within the package, outside of its package, uh, and this is sometimes called the visibility of that method or field. And there are uh, keywords in Java that we use to, to specify this visibility. So for method and methods and fields, there are four different uh, access specifiers. Um, the two that we'll focus on are public and private. So let's go 
through those in some detail. So public says this is this method or this field is accessible to everyone with no restrictions. Uh, and so uh, a public method can always be, be can be called by uh, any uh, anyone who, with a reference to that object. Um, and it is through these public methods that people using an object, other code that uses an object, it's through these public methods that, that, that it will interact with, with your object. And uh, a good rule of thumb is that fields should almost never be public because fields are the, the data that's actually inside the object. And this is really something that we want to uh, abstract in terms of assumptions that people using the object uh, can make about what it's doing. So if the fields are public, that means anyone can access, uh, access those fields and that means that they can use the object in a way that is tied to the specific implementation, to the specific way data is represented inside of it. Um, and we'd really have them uh, interact with the object through public methods, which can interact with and manipulate the internal data of the object in whatever way they need to in order to accomplish the purpose of that method. And that internal representation is then able to change uh, and still be, and that method is still supported. And why is, why is the main method always public? Why do we have public static void? Um, we have the public part because the main method is how people outside the class actually run it as a program, and so therefore it has to be public. And at the other end of things, we have the private uh, uh, visibility, and this says this method or this field is only accessible in the class where it's declared. So a private field, um, which is what most of your fields should be, uh, is not accessible uh, or visible to any to, to someone who's created that object, for example. Only the public uh, public things will be will be visible. Um, and these are the two public and private. Uh, these are the two access modifiers uh, that we'll primarily use uh, in this course. And uh, in fact, it will be a, an expectation of coding style that every method and field uh, in any class you write is either uh, declared to be public or private. And these keywords, as we'll see in examples in a moment, appear before the type, uh, uh, either the return type or before the of a method or before the type of a field when it's declared. The other two uh, access modifiers, which are kind of in between, uh, public and private are as follows. We have uh, protected, and this says uh, that a method or field is accessible to all classes in the same package. Um, so if you have uh, a bunch of related classes that need to mess with each other's internal data, um, protected is a way to accomplish that. Protected actually um, uh, gives one more, so actually protected is two steps above above private, one step below public, uh, and that protected also allow makes uh, the the method or field accessible to any class that extends uh, uh, the uh, the class in question. Um, and this particular combination of effects uh, is somewhat situ is very situational. It's just not that likely that you uh, that you what specifically you want is the functionality that protected gives you and so it's uncommon that you would actually need to use it. So far in the first two topics we've seen uh, methods and fields without any of these. Without, uh, we've seen public on main but everything else has just not had public or private or protected and that's actually valid Java code, and that is what's called default when you give no access modifier. That's the default visibility. Uh, and this is like protect, this is the one that's in between protected and private, in that default says it's accessible to all classes declared in the same package, uh, but it doesn't have this additional uh, aspect that protected does. But as I said, public and private are what 
uh, are what we're going to focus on. Uh, so let's look at uh, a class, an example uh, class representing a, a, a circle. And so uh, you'll notice that I have a private field uh, that this internal data of my object, I'm going to declare private by putting the keyword private before the type and variable name. And that all of my methods in this case are declared public. My constructor is public. Folks outside the class should be able to use that. Uh, and then two accessor methods to get the radius uh, of the circle and to compute the compute and return the area. Both of those are public. And you also see that that uh, I've declared this class public as well. Uh, this has to do with um, uh, kind of how the class uh, is available outside the package, so most of the time you'll want to be uh, declaring a, a, a class like this public. Uh, and with this sort of, uh, w with this class definition, it would mean that if I created a circle object, I could say, uh, uh, I could say dot get radius, but I could not put dot radius. Um, because this radius field is private and therefore not accessible anywhere, it, not accessible to any code outside of this class definition. So inside this class definition, I need to be able to refer to the internal data of the class, so I can still do that when it's private, but outs, any code outside can't touch it. All right, so moving on to static, what does this mean? So you may remember from the last topic, I said that a field or method can be associated with a class or with an object. And so far, we've only thought about things associated with objects, that uh, this circle radius is a field associated with a particular instance of a circle, a particular circle object. And we can create many different circle objects, each of which have their own ra uh, uh, radius. And so where does static come into this? Well, static is how we make something associated with a class and not an individual object. So what does that mean? We have our, our circle definition here, and uh, we can uh, create a circle with a radius of 10, circle temp equals new circle parens 10, and uh, we can use dot get area, to get uh, the area and store that in a separate variable. And so now I'm going to extend uh, this circle class in two ways. These are all examples here of uh, um, instance uh, methods, right? Get area has to be used with a particular instance of circle because it requires uh, using the instance variable, the radius, the piece of data that's associated with an actual instantiated object. Um, the circle class, it has a radius, but that radius doesn't have any value until we construct a, a, uh, an actual instance of circle. So now I'm going to extend it in two ways. Uh, I'm going to create this private, private static double pi uh, because uh, instead of writing out uh, this value of pi, um, 3.14159265, anywhere I need it inside the circle class. I'm just going to define it once um, and uh, then use this variable pi in, in other places. And the other way that I've extended the circle class is with this compute area method. And I've made this a static method. And notice that it takes a parameter r, and it's not using radius, it's using this parameter r, and it's computing the area of a circle of radius r. And so get area returns the area of a specific circle object. Compute area just takes a radius and returns the area of a circle with that radius, right? It doesn't compute area, nothing about this relates to a particular circle object we've created. And um, 
this is uh, the purpose of the static keyword is to say, all right, compute area is a method associated with a circle class. It's something that you can ask the circle class to do, uh, and it's not connected to an individual circle object. And so we can have uh, code like this where we use the name of the class dot our static method, and we can call this static method and get the area of a circle of radius 10 um, without needing to first create that circle and then call get area. So if what we wanted was just to get this area, and we didn't actually care about uh, keeping the circle object around uh, or doing other things with it, um, this static method is, is a handy way to accomplish that. Now, why, uh, why did this uh, field pi need to be static? So all, no instance variables, no non-static fields can be used inside a static method. And if you think about why would this be, our non-static field like radius, it depends on, it is associated with an instance of the circle class, right? It's associated with a particular circle object. And so if we have a static method compute area that can be called independent of any particular circle object, it can't use this radius field inside of it. Right? That just, that wouldn't make any sense. It's uh, which circles radius would, would that be? Uh, by the same token, we want, we have this static variable pi. It's static, so it's not associated with any particular object, it's associated with a circle class, so the circle class as a whole has a single field pi um, that's the same across no matter how many, whether there are zero instances of the, cir uh, of cir the circle class or a hundred, uh, there's just one static variable pi, it has this initial value, and thus we can use it inside our static method. One improvement that we could make to this code would be to make this pi variable immutable, which means that its value can never change. Uh, and this makes sense. Uh, the value of pi, I've written an approximation of it here in the code. There's no reason it would need to change as the program is running. So anything that doesn't ever need to change, it's a good idea to make that immutable because then the compiler and the Java runtime will enforce that immutability, it will make sure that that value can't ever change and thus prevent some possible bugs if some piece of code accidentally uh, were going to change it. And there's another keyword that we can use to do that. Um, we can declare a variable final, which means that it's not possible to reassign the variable to some other value after it's given an initial value. Uh, and so we would say public static final. Uh, now, making it uh, final is the keyword that makes it immutable. And I've also changed it from private to public here. And that's because uh, once we've made it immutable, once uh, uh, code outside the class can't change its value in any way, then it's fine for it to be for it to be public. Uh, that it's not part of the internal uh, data that the uh, that our circle class is is manipulating. It's simply a, a constant value uh, that is useful for for computation the circle is doing. And by convention, these uh, static final variables are typically referred to as constants, and they're also typically written in all caps to differentiate them from uh, other kinds of variables. All right, final part, let's talk about interfaces. So an interface is like a class, except that all it does is declare what methods are present in a class. And so in some ways, uh, it's, it's nice to think about an interface as a contract or a template 
of what methods a class must provide. And in particular, interfaces don't provide the implementation of any methods themselves. And so here's an example. Uh, I'm defining a, an interface called shape. Uh, and this would be in a file shape.java. And notice how instead of the word class here, I have the word interface. And uh, all that is present inside this interface are the method signatures, which is uh, an access specifier, a return type, and a method name, and any parameters. Uh, and then instead of a method body, there's just a semicolon. And so, uh, and I'm defining kind of a contract for what things that uh, are shapes, what methods would they have? And specific shapes, as we'll see, may implement other methods in addition to these, uh, but this is the, the set of things that all shapes of all different kinds, they're all going to have, uh, they're all going to be able to get a position, which will be a, a two-dimensional point. You're going to be able to change that position, and all shapes will have an area in this definition. And notice the import up at the top here, uh, this point 2D is a class provided by this uh, algs4 uh, library which was developed uh, at Princeton and this is uh, all sorts of useful stuff in ALGS for um, and uh, we'll be using it at, at various points throughout the course. So what do we actually do with an interface like shape? Uh, well interfaces are part of something uh, that is called the class hierarchy which is you have a set of classes and or interfaces and they have relationships between them that form a sort of a sort of hierarchy. So there are two kinds of relationships uh, that uh, interfaces and, and, and classes have. One is called uh, the extends relationship. Uh, and so we can have one definition extend another. Uh, and so in this case interfaces can extend other interfaces and classes can extend other classes. Uh, you wouldn't have an interface extend a class or a class extend an interface. So it's interfaces can extend other interfaces, classes can extend other classes. Now what is this, uh, what does extend actually do? Um, when one definition extends another, it inherits, it gets all the public methods and data um, from the original definition. And so uh, in this example here, I am defining an interface for a polygon, right? And a polygon is a type of shape. A polygon will have all the methods that a shape does. Uh, and so here I say public interface polygon extends shape. And so without having to copy paste them over again, this polygon interface has the get position, set position, and get area that the shape interface does. And then inside the definition of polygon, I can specify additional public methods that this interface uh, has in addition to those that it inherits from shape. And so in this case, I have defined a get vertexes, um, or I could have called it get vertices, uh, a method that is going to return an array of 2D points that are the vertexes of whatever polygon this is. And again, this is an interface, so it's just declaring the methods that something that is a polygon will have. And so there's some additional um, terminology associated with it, this extends relationship. Um, and in particular, the original shape is said to be the supertype, and the extension is said to be the subtype. So we'd say polygon is a subtype of shape, and the reverse would be shape is a supertype of polygon. And this gets at the relation, the, the kind of semantic relationship between these, where every polygon is a shape, right? Whether it's a, a square, uh, a hexagon, a triangle, these are all both polygons and they are all shapes. Uh, but not every shape 
is a polygon. For example, uh, a circle, I would say that that is a shape, but that is not a polygon. Uh, and uh, one main use, there, there are basically two nice things that this uh, kind of inheritance, this extends relationship will do for us. Uh, first, as I said, it inherits all these public methods, so we don't have to copy paste, so we get some code, code reuse there. Uh, and it also uh, means that if we say have an array of shapes, that array could contain both polygons and shapes, because every polygon is a shape. Uh, and so this um, subtype relationship uh, applies to the uh, type checking that the Java compiler is doing. And so if I declare a variable of type shape, I can assign something that is of type polygon to that variable because a polygon is a shape. All right. Now we get to the implements relationship, and this is where we see what, how interfaces are actually used. And so uh, in this example, I'm going to create, I'm going to define a class for a, uh, a, a type of, of polygon, a rectangle in this case, and I'm actually going to provide a definition for this, for this class. So this is not an interface, it's a class, um, and this rectangle class implements Polygon. So this is uh, this other keyword in Java implements, which says, all right, this class will provide, will meet the contract defined by a particular interface. So the type that appears after implements here, that has to be an interface. You can't implement another class. You have to implement a, an interface. And what you're saying is, okay, I promise to provide all the methods uh, that this interface uh, says I should. And so um, this rectangle class uh, m must provide each of uh, the e e each of the public methods uh, in the polygon interface. And because polygon extends shape, it also has to implement the methods defined in the shape interface. And so uh, these interfaces don't say anything about the data that this rectangle object, uh, this rectangle class need, needs to have. So it's kind of up to the implementer of rectangle what data they use in order to satisfy the, the methods required by, by the polygon interface. In this case, I, I chose to keep track of a width and a height and a position to find a constructor that, t that takes uh, two doubles to initialize the width and the height, and then just uh, creates a new random position. And so this is uh, uh, using another uh, object from that algs4 library, in this case, std short for standard. Uh, so standard random. And this uh, standard random implements a number of uh, static uh, functions um, that are, are can generate different uh, sorts of random numbers. And so uh, uniform here is just between 0 and 1. So I create uh, a new random point for the position of the rectangle. And then I implement uh, accessors for uh, the width and height of the rectangle. And then comes the part where I implement the methods that are required by the interface. And uh, there's get position and set position and get area, which are all required by the shape interface. Uh, and then there's get vertexes, which is what's required by the polygon interface. So one thing that might jump out to you is all these at overrides uh, on, all, on all of these. And uh, this at override is something called an annotation uh, in Java, which means that it doesn't actually have uh, any runtime effect. So I could remove all these at overrides, it would still be valid Java code, and in fact it would compile to exactly the same thing. Um, what this at override does for us is it's telling the compiler, all right, this get position method, uh, it is 
specifically overriding, it is implementing um, uh, a method that is declared in uh, an interface uh, that this class is implementing or another class that this class is extending. And so uh, the compiler knows to compare the types that I have for this get position method to the one in the super type and make sure that those match up. Uh, there is a sort of subtle bug where if I had declared a method get position that returned a different type of thing, uh, this is uh, uh, or, or a set position uh, that took a different kind of argument uh, and did something else with it. Uh, this is something that Java lets you do. You can have kind of multiple methods of the same name with different types and based on uh, the types involved in whatever statement they're a part of in the Java code, Java will use the appropriate version. But it does mean that I could accidentally have a get position method that because its type is, uh, it's wrong, is wrong doesn't match up with the one in the interface. But this override annotation tells the compiler to check that for me. So long story short, it's a good practice that can catch some bugs for you if you put override on, on all the, the, the methods where you're providing an implementation for an interface method. Uh, and so the get and set position and the get area, all very straightforward. Uh, get vertexes, uh, a little more involved. Um, declare an array of points. There are, a rectangle has four uh, vertexes, so it's an array of four points. Uh, and then going clockwise, starting with the upper left, based on the position and the width and the height of the rectangle, compute the X and Y positions of each of the four vert vertices, uh, assign them to the elements of the array, and then return it. So we have our class hierarchy of shape. polygon rectangle. And uh, what I want to show you now is that we can have something that's a little more interesting than just a chain. We can then, so this was an extends. This was an implements. And then we're going to make another implements relationship where we're going to create a circle class that implements the shape interface. And this is going to be the circle class uh, similar to the one that we were talking about uh, uh, just a little bit ago with our static pi constant. I've uh, now added a position uh, among its private fields. Same uh, initialize the position to a random point uh, in the constructor. And uh, similar overrides for, uh, in fact, identical, identical for get and set position. Um, the nice thing is that uh, the shape interface says you have to have a get area. But of course, a circle and a rectangle, those are different computations for get area. And so our interface says all, right, all shapes have to have the ability to compute an area. But then inside circle and rectangle, we actually define how that works for that particular type of shape. And we still have the static uh, method compute area that we talked about before. So uh, you may be thinking, well, representing some, uh, defining classes for some shapes, that's fine. Um, but what would we actually, like, what do we do with these shapes? What, what might, what problem might this solve? Uh, and so, uh, linked from, from the website, and I'll, I'll go over this in uh, the learning block. Uh, a nice thing to do with a class hierarchy of shapes is to draw them and maybe even animate them. So uh, there'll be an example, uh, the flying shapes uh, example uh, will, will show how that might work. And with that, we're done with object-oriented programming part two, and I'll see some of you in the learning block.